Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my Instagram account under Robin underscore Norgren or on my website at josiesartschool.com. Let's start with some words from the Firestarter Sessions by Daniel Laporte. There is nothing more turned on than a person with a dream and the guts to pick up the phone. Dreaming is essential, but it's only part of the equation. You've got to put a strategy into play. All the overachievers are out there are like, duh, milestones, people, milestones. Passion is the wind in your sails, and practicality is the rudder. You need both to get where you're going. As the saying goes, the truth is that which works. You can manage your time like a ninja, Make vision boards, set quarterly goals like the future's so bright you gotta wear shades. But if all those systems don't work, then something's not working. You can meditate till your sit bones are blue, pray, process, train, affirm, think positive, therapize. And if you're still not a calmer, more generous person who speaks kindly to the waiter, and takes traffic jams in stride, then maybe how you measure the results of your questing needs to be calibrated. If your soul fire still looks like it's just flickering in the distance, a mile outside of you, then it's time to consider what gets you hot in in the here and now. This may be a radical consideration. The the CEO of a billion-dollar entertainment company once said to me, There's an evolutionary, and then there's revolutionary. Evolutionary is a degree of change, but revolutionary changes everything. He continued, take Starbucks, for example. They revolutionized the coffee business. Anyone who follows will merely be evolutionary. Evolutionary is good. It's solid, and it can be quite fulfilling. But revolutions? Ah, that's the really exciting stuff. Who doesn't want to be revolutionary? Which would you rather be? I'm going to be revolutionary, thank you. Not warm, hot. Not bright, blazing. The hallmark of revolutionary change is that it beams out to the point of irrepressible. And it affects change in those who witness or experience it. Inward and outward revolutions happen every day. You don't necessarily have to lead a nation to independence or take on the union reps, but by all means of the spirit moves you. A revolutionary can be a whole new perspective that changes the way you work, achieve wellness, or thrive in a relationship. A revolution is a way of being that becomes a significantly better way of doing. And it shifts and lifts people up along with you and keeps the universe on the edge of itself. Revolutions can feel miraculous. From Priscilla Shearer's book, Awaken. Malachi 3.3 says, He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. My writings usually come back from my editor with one specific note. It's too long. Too long? But everything I put into the manuscript had a reason, had a place. And when the edited version arrives in my inbox, I'm shocked at what has been taken out. In my opinion, the portions he has deleted were crucial to what I was trying to say. Without them, the book has lost its cutting edge. But the editor, the expert, explains... 
If it's too long, you'll lose the reader's attention. You'll dampen the impact and usefulness of your words. Cutting it down will add to its value. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hesitantly, I submit. The divine editor does this very thing with the version of our lives that we each present to him. Cutting, shaving, dicing, carving. Until it communicates most clearly the message he wants to bring out of it and of us. The design we dreamed up took weeks, months, years to arrange. We based its narrative on desires and plans that we're certain will ensure our happiness, complete with a classic storybook ending. We've included details about our education, our family, our friends, our finances, our ministry involvement, our reputation, for all the ways we live out our service to Him. He should love this, should be floored by its full, rich storyline, and how we intend it all as a way of praising him. It's got everything. It's perfect. Taking out the red pen of his grace, God scratches through a number of plot lines, ambitions, and relationships that will prove detrimental to the direction he knows my story needs to go. Then he remites many busy tasks and frantic religious activities until they look more like solitude, stillness, and silence. My plans for finances and family have also been reworked to include less concern about what kinds of possessions we own, what kinds of clothes we wear, what kinds of image we send off to others. His rewritten text shows that my own loved ones can be comfortable with much less extravagance than I anticipated. It all looks so different now. Most of the original themes behind each chapter have been changed. All new priorities have been penciled in. Even the title I give it, My Life, has been redrawn with the subhead, the edited version. I push back against these cuts, these deletions, but he is kind. God whispers, daughter, if your story is too full, it will lose its purpose. Cutting it down will add to its value. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hesitantly, yet somehow sure he's right, I submit to my editor again. 1 Timothy 6, 6, 7 Godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. From Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art. Rationalization is resistance's right-hand man. Its job is to keep us from feeling the shame we would feel if we truly faced what cowards we are for not doing our work. Michael, don't knock rationalization. What would we be without it? I don't know anyone who can sit through the day without two or three juicy rationalizations. They're more important than sex. Sam, Ah, uh, come on. Nothing's more important than sex. Michael. Oh, yeah? Have you ever gone a week without a rationalization? Jeff Goldblum, Tom Beninger, Beringer, and Lawrence Caston's The Big Chill. But rationalization has its sidekick. It's that part of our psyche that actually believes what rationalization tells us. It's one thing to lie to ourselves. It's another thing to believe it. Resistance is fear, but resistance is too cunning to show itself naked in its form. Why? Because if resistance lets us see clearly that our own fear is preventing us from doing our work, 
we may feel shame at this. And shame may drive us to act in the face of fear. Resistance doesn't want us to do this. So it brings in rationalization. Rationalization is resistance's spin doctor. It's resistance's way of hiding the big stick behind its back. Instead of showing us our fear, which might shame us and impel us to do our work. Resistance presents us with a series of plausible, rational justifications for why we shouldn't do our work. What's particularly insidious about the rationalizations that resistance presents to us is that a lot of them are true. They're legitimate. Our wife may really be in in her eighth month of pregnancy. She may in truth need us at home. Our department may really be instituting a changeover that will eat up hours of our time. Indeed, it may make sense to put off finishing our dissertation, at least till after the baby's born. What resistance leaves out, of course, is that all this means diddly. Tolstoy had 13 kids and wrote War and Peace. Lance Armstrong had cancer and won the Tour de France three years and counting. <laughs>